morning. Good morning. Welcome to Messiah Lutheran Church. He is risen. He is risen Today we have the sacrament, so uh, when you are invited to come up, just simply stand back from the rail and I will put it up here and you know the, the drill. So tonight, or tonight, this morning, we begin our worship with In Thee is Gladness. I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto you all. 
And in the stead by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, 
and the disciples gave them to the crowd, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces left over, and those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We confess together our Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all the world, God of God, Light of life, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us in him and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and is in heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory, to judge both the living and the dead, through the kingdom and will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I have always one baptism for the mission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Please be seated. We continue with the hymn of the day. Come unto me, be here.
Christ, peace and mercy from God our Father and from our Lord who is the Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. The account that we heard today of Jesus feeding the 5,000 plus women and children is found in all four Gospels. So it's probably familiar to most of us. Today we heard Matthew's account, which is actually the simplest of the four, the one which provides us with the fewest details. And that's really unusual for Matthew. Matthew is the one that goes out of his way to explain what it means in the prophets and in the fulfillment of certain Old Testament scriptures. He omits from this account, Mark's emphasis that God is, or Jesus, is the good shepherd. That Jesus sees the crowds as harassed and helpless, sheep without a shepherd, and then has them sit down on that green grass in Mark 6, 34 and 39, a lush pasture, even in the wilderness, beautiful, a place for his sheep. And we might have expected Matthew to include this and add a few pointers to it as a fulfillment of Moses' prayer that the people of God not be harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd, number 2727. Or concerning the green grass, to let us know what it says in Psalm 23. After all, that's the shepherd's prayer, but he doesn't. In the same way, Matthew omits Luke's emphasis on Jesus teaching the people and speaking to them of the kingdom of God in Luke 9:11, before he even feeds them, to which Matthew could have nicely added references like that of Samuel or Zechariah of God's Israel, there is only one true king, 1 Samuel 8, 7, Zechariah 9, 9, or of the kingdom of truth, which Jesus had come to establish and he omits the details that John includes on the fact that Jesus was testing his disciples for he knew what he was going to do in John 6.6. 6. Or the fact that it was the time of the Passover, John 6.4. Or that it was a young lad who in fact had the five loaves of bread and two fish in John 6.9. There's a lot for Matthew to chew on here. Of course, Jesus being the prophet greater than Moses in Deuteronomy 18, 15. And of course, as Jesus as the new and real Passover. All you could say are important details, but without them, strip away all those details from this event. And what you have left is Matthew's account. And it's a clear focus that he wants to bring to light. Without any other incidental clutter, Matthew's message is this, Jesus having compassion. Now, maybe you're used to hearing that a lot and knowing Jesus in that way, but I think it's worthwhile to look a little bit deeper about compassion and just what it means. Let us first realize what compassion is not. It is not practical. In this narrative, it is the disciples who are being practical. They are experienced in the ways of the world. At least some of them were businessmen before leaving that life behind to follow Jesus. They knew the value of a denarii. And so it was reasonable, it was common sense that it would be practical for Jesus to send the crowds away. The reasons were many. It was a desolate place. The day was almost over. There was not enough food out there in the middle of nowhere to feed such a crowd. And maybe even the disciples' own stomachs were rumbling and grumbling. So be realistic, Jesus. It's time to send them away. But Jesus doesn't do the practical thing. He does, though, have compassion, and so he does the compassionate thing. Compassion interrupts us in our lives and what we are doing. Compassion stops what we're doing in order to see to the needs of others. Compassion makes us go out of our way to help another. 
Compassion means sacrificing yourself because someone else has a need that's come up. Whether that means sacrificing time or money or energy or sleep or whatever else you're really hoping to get done today. To help a family member, a neighbor, or even a stranger, that's why compassion is so hard and increasingly rare in our world today. Our world where I don't even have enough time to get done what I need to get done, let alone stop and help someone else. Our world of time budgets and little time and lots of demands. Compassion just doesn't seem to be practical, nor does it seem sensible, does it? So how does a compassionate Jesus respond to these practical disciples? He invites them to be compassionate too. To be compassionate with him and with others. And he says they need not go away. You give them something to eat. And of course their response is, but we're not able. We only have five loaves of bread and two fish. So Jesus says, well, bring them here. Now, I don't know if Jesus said this in frustration, disappointed that his disciples still didn't get it, or if he had a little bit of a smile on his face. I suspect the latter, the smile. For Jesus is the compassion one, and he would be having compassion on his disciples too to teach them that with him, there is no only, only five loaves, only a few fish. When you have Jesus, you have everything, enough to feed 5,000 men plus women and children, enough to feed a world full of Christians with his very own body and blood given and shed for you. No place is desolate or empty when Jesus is there. So Jesus takes the bread, and the fish, and looking up to his Father in heaven, he says a blessing, he says grace, a thank you. Thank you for the people. Thank you for these disciples, even if they don't quite get it. Thank you for the food. Thank you for the opportunity to feed them, to teach the disciples what they need to learn. That God isn't practical, he's compassionate. So after giving thanks, Jesus gives the bread and the fish back to the disciples. And you know what he told them to do? You give them something to eat. And they do, and much to their surprise, they were able. Jesus even feeds their rumbling and grumbling stomachs too. Turns out there was more than enough. All ate and were satisfied ready now to go home, not in want or in need, but full and content. The God who is not practical, but compassionate. That's what Jesus shows us. That's who Jesus is. A God who cares about the needs of his people and provides for them. And not just spiritually and not just physically, but both, for we are both. And this has been true all along. For God is a compassionate giving God. Paul wrote of all that God gave to his people in the Old Testament. We, as we heard it today in our Romans reading, to them he says, belong the adoption. God choosing them out of all nations on the earth to give the glory. God himself leading them and dwelling with them as a power of, of fire by night and a cloud by day the covenants given to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David, the giving of the law, God's glorious revelation of himself on Mount Sinai, the worship in the tabernacle where God would be for his people to provide them with forgiveness of their sin, the promises of a land, their own peace and protection, and all that they would need, the patriarchs, the fathers of the faith, God's perfect faithfulness to them and the Christ in the flesh, who is not just flesh and blood, but God over all, blessed forever. So much had been given to them. So much has been given 
to us. But how often are we blind to it and blind to our Lord's compassion? How quick do we forget his work and faithfulness of old? How quick to look and trust only what I can set my hands on instead of the fact that we are in his hands and therefore think it's not enough. I am not able. Repent. Repent of your doubt, of your lack of compassion, of your thinking God somehow hasn't given you what you need. There's no only with Jesus. With him, your hands are always filled, always filled with compassion. Those hands which baptize you and now feed you, whose hands shield you and bless you, whose hands went to the cross for you to pay the price that you could not, and not just for food, but for all your shortcomings, all of your sins, all of your rebellion, all of your doubt, that you may have life, and not just life, but abundant life, that you who are thirsty may drink, that you are, who are hungry may have food, and not just some mere bread and fish, but his very body and blood given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sin to satisfy you so that now in Christ you're ready to go. Go to your home filled and content, your home here, yes, but even more, your home with him to be with him forever. For you have Jesus, and when you have him, you have everything and far more than enough. And having done so for you, Jesus invites you now to be compassionate to others. Like the disciples, he gives you what you need to do so, including the heart. And to realize this, Christian's life may not be all that practical. This Christian life may call us to do a lot of impractical things. Things like make no earthly sense. Where you put your money, how you spend your time, the things that maybe don't give you the biggest return on the investment in the world's eyes. To get interrupted, to not get something done, to go out of your way, to make sacrifices for others. And that's not always easy. Maybe it's never easy, but it's okay. Maybe the interruption and in getting you to show compassion is the compassion that you need right now. God is not practical. He is compassionate, and that's better. Practical would have been to choose better disciples in the first place, right? Or to find better Christians than us. But God is not practical. He is compassionate, and that's better. And so you are a child of God. And so, as we prayed earlier, Heavenly Father, though we do not deserve your goodness, still you provide for all our needs of body and soul. And that's the foundation. That's what we heard from St. Matthew today. So grant us your Holy Spirit that we may acknowledge your gifts, give, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Serve him who has everything. How? Well, we heard that today, too, by serving others in compassion. Like father, like son, like son, like Christians. For when you do it to the least of these, Jesus says, you've done it unto me. Matthew 25, 40. In Jesus' holy name, amen and amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We continue with the offertory. <laughs>
bidden us to come to receive mercy beyond measure. Hear us as we heed your call and turn to you in prayer, confident of your promise to hear and answer us. Father, we have sought meaning, comfort, and sustenance in all the wrong places. Grant us your Holy Spirit that our hearts may be turned to your word, that we may hunger for your Son's body and blood, that we may discern truth from error. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Father, we give you thanks that you have blessed us beyond what we deserve and given to us, your church. Guard her life by your Spirit and strengthen her witness before all nations. Bless all pastors and church workers in their service to us in your name, and bless those now considering and preparing for church work vocation. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Father, we too quickly focus on what we lack and not upon your unlimited mercy. Bless all relief agencies and services of your church on behalf of the hungry, the homeless, the hurting, and those who have lost hope. Bless all those visited by disaster and tragedy, and open our hearts to help them recover from their loss. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Father, we daily, <clears throat> Father, we are daily blessed to know abundance and freedom. Bless those who defend us from our enemies, who serve in our government and who protect us in our communities. Be out, be with our president, the Congress, our governor, and our judges and magistrates, that they may determine the right path and lead us with honor and integrity according to your will. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Father, we suffer with all manner of affliction. Hear us and grant us healing according to your good and gracious will. Strengthen this time of trial of peace at the last. And we pray especially for those we now need silently in our hearts. Good Lord, deliver us and teach us to depend upon your grace in all things. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father, we know that your steadfast love and mercy endure forever, but our faith is daily tested and tempted. Give us strength and endurance that we may not despair, but have confidence in your sufficient grace. Guide us to seek our consolation in your word and sacraments, and prepare us to receive the Lord's body and blood in this holy communion. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Father, we are daily and richly surrounded with your love and care. Grant us eyes to see your mercies new every morning in grateful hearts that we that we have received, that we may share with those in need generously to support the work of your church. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Father, remember the saints who lived by your mercy and died in Christ. We long for that day when all the visions will end and the church in heaven and earth shall be one in your presence, singing and praising your name in the glorious kingdom that has no end. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Father, we ask you to grant all things needful and to keep us from all things harmful and to be our salvation, for we trust in your wisdom and in your love. Teach us to pray without fear. Your will be done through Jesus Christ our Lord. We continue with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God.
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
epistle. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you until life everlasting. Depart in peace.
so nice to see you all. A little bit cooler today, still pretty warm. I feel for Sue who was in here practicing when the sanctuary was 88 degrees. And no moving there, no doubt. So thank you very much for your playing today. What a blessing. And God bless you all. Have a great week in the Lord. And remember, every evening we've got uh, devotions. Also, and I know it's not customary, but we haven't been in the fellowship hall. So I'll bring it to your attention. Two days ago was somebody's birthday. But we're not going to mention Carol Hadley's name. So we're going to sing happy birthday anyway in the sanctuary. I know it's not appropriate, but services are over because we can't gather too tightly. So happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Carol. Happy birthday to you. Jesus bless you. May Jesus bless you. May he guide you and keep you. May Jesus bless you. Now, do you want to let anybody know how young you are? She told me already, I know, so. Go ahead, let them know. 92 years old. God bless you. Have a great week. And all of you, have a great week in the Lord. Chuck.